Um, before we actually get started though, I actually just wanted to say this game kind of changed after the news uh, came out about Justin O'Royalan, but I still had this whole video basically done and I thought it would be a waste just to not upload it because the game is very different than him, I guess, even though he had main inspiration and said a lot of what the things was going on in the game. The team itself is not Justin Roiland. And they did a very good job at making a game that is just good. And before the news really came out, the, the game was actually getting a decent amount of praise from critics and especially the fans playing the game. A lot of YouTube videos talking about their Easter eggs, different spoiling sections, uh, mechanics, everyone was actually hopping on and having a pretty decent time. But I feel like after the news came out about Justin Roiland, it kind of just died off the game, just ended nowhere, and I probably should have uploaded it before it actually came out, but I had a little editing errors. The news came out, and it just felt weird to upload it, but, and now that he's especially away from the situation, he won't be in Rick and Morty anymore. He won't be working with this game developing studios anymore, that even though he created technically all of this, this is not his work anymore. Um, from now on, he will not be participating in any of the creative decisions. And I hope it stays like that because people need to take accountability for their actions, not just because they did something wrong and have to take accountability for themselves. They have to do it and be responsible for the people around them, their employees, the company, anything they create. These people have jobs. They need them jobs because they... This is what they want to do with their lives. They want to create a game or create a show like Rick and Morty. They That whole thing can't be shut down just because one guy is a fucking idiot, okay? Um, so anyways, I hope you enjoyed this video. This is my Han Life review. Take all of this with as uh, just a game review. Don't think about it in that light. Uh, thank you. Hope you enjoy. You don't often see indie games that feel and look like a AAA one. While I don't think High on Life is as boisterous as actual AAA titles, I think it does a really good job of melding the capabilities of AAA, but includes that charm and individuality that these great indie games have. The game studio's Squanch Games created High on Life, a Rick and Morty styled approach to first person shooters. It's not a Rick and Morty game though by any means, but it is in the same ballpark with its comedy, its stylistic world, and the character designs, and even the voice acting. It's a super self-aware game, and it's consistently naughty, so I guess to stay true to that game, maybe even I'll be grittier in this video, a bit more repulsive than I normally am, so uh, damn. I guess. I this game actually took me by surprise. It's something I've wanted to try out even when I knew barely anything about it but I didn't realize what journey I was going to get myself into. It plays the game off as a silly comedic shooter where you blast enemies, talk to insanely random NPCs, and gain companions which are these guns known as Gatlians. But the more you actually get into this adventure, the better it becomes, never really dipping in any entertainment value. Which is a great thing, and probably due to its shorter length, I, I think I beat it in around 9 hours taking my time. It's not the mindless shooter I thought it would necessarily be, it's a pretty well executed story that had me invested the whole way through, so let me dive a little deeper into the game known as High on Life. I thought to give this video a little bit of structure, let's just label the three main things. The good, which can be all the positive aspects and everything I liked with the game. The bad, or anything I felt flawed in my playthrough, and even the flaws I had when playing on Xbox. And the funny, I think. I love when games are essentially the love child of multiple other games. High on Life is a Rick and Morty shooter, but it combines a ton of aspects from all these popular games, incorporating them in as if they were their own. The high stress arena style fighting with several staple mobility options remind me of the newer Doom titles, and even hints of Borderlands in there. The vibrant space worlds you explore and the landscape designs kind of fall into an outer worlds almost, but definitely a no man's sky. High on Life feels like all of these games crushed into one package. It takes all of these inspirations, setting and gameplay wise, and fits them fairly nice. But I wouldn't say any particular attribute is better than its inspiration. After you unlock all the movement options though, roaming around the world feels pretty smooth, 
and the worlds themselves are well put together, even if they're slightly linear. Mentioning the movement options, you have a power slide, a jetpack, a grapple, a dodge, and of course a run. They all feel really good to use, but I didn't find myself using dodges too often. Moving around the arena like fights can be satisfying though, with using your jetpack to maneuver around enemies or escaping and repositioning with your grapple, if there is grappling ledges or rails around of course. That alongside the gun variety gives some diversity to the combat portions, since those can be slightly repetitive. And the length of the entire game is actually a plus. I don't think this game could have lasted more than 20 hours. It might have run dry by then. The story was quick, and the humor didn't become too oversaturated, at least for me. It for sure has a demographic. I feel like the younger you are, the funnier this game actually is, but you still have to be like a certain age of maturity to where you actually understand what the hell they're even talking about. I mean, I never laughed that hard, but every 30 minutes or so of gameplay, I did appreciate the jokes that were there. The guns are honestly why this game is as good as it is. Not only do the guns play this massive part in the story, but they can be humorous and pretty satisfying to use. They, alongside most of this game, is just so self-aware. Which a couple times it actually got me a little bit. Gonna turn your whole species into drugs. Can you handle a gun? Because you know I'm kind of a gun, and if you don't use me to kill those two three What the fuck? You just paused the game. This doesn't help at all. Are you an idiot? Everyone knows pause button? And what fucking game is the pause button shoot? You see, most games don't do this. And if they do, it's nowhere to the degree high on life does it. They do break the scale when it comes to the fourth wall references and rule breaks in gaming. Sometimes too much to where it's a little bad, but for the most part entertaining. And the guns, also known as the Gatlians, really shine in this game. Kenny is your first gun. He's most similar to a standard pistol, with this glob-like special attack acting like an explosive almost. Gus is really cool. He's basically a shotgun, and his alternate attack is a sharp disc-like blade that can bounce off of enemies or stick to walls. He's one of my favorite characters in this game, and he has some of the best voice lines. Sweezy is literally a halo needler. Bar for bar, when you aim down your sight, she even charges it up like the needler, but it's a fun gun. Her alternate shot is actually interesting, it's a sphere that slows down time. Creature is just a strange weapon, but they essentially shoot out little alien babies that can chow down on the enemies and even mind control them. They can even help with tasks. And the final Gatlian is Let's Do It, which, uh, yeah, it's, it's Let's Do It. Not much to explain. Not a gun, but you can't forget Knifey, a psychotic knife that just wants to kill everything possible. He can grapple onto things. See, all the Gatlians are unique, and with their alternate movesets, they become important for like the puzzles and maneuver in this game, while adding variety to the combat. Which is amazing. I, I love when my moveset and weapons in a game is more efficient than just fighting. You gotta use all of the weapons to progress in game. Without this element, I honestly would have stuck with Kenny since he has a really good rate of fire and a damage output. I found myself liking their contrasting personalities and some of the dialogue they have as a team. And making them important for the story, I think was just a great design move. I really love the small little details and extra content High on Life includes. It's definitely my favorite part about the entire game. There are tons of video game references spread throughout your journey, a very popular one being the kid who teases you before going to an area called the slums. He pokes at you and tells you to shoot him, and of course if you actually do shoot him enough, you get an achievement that says Fallout doesn't let you do this. Or the fact that there's an entire movie theater in this game and you can go inside and watch an entirely old movie while three aliens commentate over it like it's a mystery science theater episode. High on Life is riddled with quirky segments like this, it really gave me the drive to keep going with this game, because I was genuinely interested in what secrets it had to offer. Story wise, this game was also fantastic. It kind of felt like a cheesy Rick and Morty episode concept wise, but with its execution it turned out really fun. Earth is invaded by some bad aliens named the G3, a cartel organization that turns other alien races into drugs and humans just happen to be a race that gives an amazing addictive high. So now that everyone is a drug and Earth gets taken over, you meet Kenny, and together the two of you make a pact to take down the G3 gang. You both have different reasons, but a common goal which sets up a cool buddy duo storyline. You take this warp device from one of the alien ships that landed on Earth, and you and your sister use that to warp your entire home to another planet specifically Blim City. In this cyberpunk-esque city, you find a homeless dude named Gene, who you find out was this old famous bounty hunter. 
You guys join forces and he helps you with equipment so you can actually take down G3. That's basically the premise for the game, but this is where the real fun begins. I'll quickly go through the story, so spoiler warning, skip ahead to this time in the video if you haven't played the game yet. The entire game is spent tracking down the bosses, which are your bounties. They are all of the leaders of some kind in this G3 cartel, so you can make your way up through the ranks by killing them all and saving the Gatlings along the way, which are the ones you add to your team. There's not too many bosses, but all of them have a pretty different playstyle, not anything unorthodox in my opinion though. But as you fight through these bounties, you learn more about the worlds, G3, and even the Gatlians you use. Apparently the Gatlians world was destroyed and put to ruins by the G3. It also led into the invasion of Earth. Of course, the unfortunate soul who led G3 to all of that was Kenny your alien pistol partner. It's not an insane twist, but a really well executed one since he comes clean to you in, in Applebee's, a, a space Applebee's. But he admits he cares about you, which I thought was a really nice touch. And he confesses his accidental betrayal to the other Galleons in your team, which all of them have different responses to, mostly negative. The group dynamic changed for a while, and that added some heat to the characters. Gus and Sweezy hated Kenny, Creature was trying to make him feel okay about it, and Kenny felt horrible the entire time. But not to mention the gun lets do it. He's essentially a Gatlian resurrected in a science lab. But before the Gatlian's planet actually blew up, Les do it was Kenny's best friend. And before the planet actually did blow, Kenny knew what was going on cause he made this mistake with the G3. And he knew Les do it was dying and he couldn't tell his best friend that he was responsible for all of this. So finding Let's Do It in a lab made Kenny feel sick and made him confess his wrongdoings to me and the other guns. I really liked this plot point in this story. It felt kind of natural and tugged at my heartstrings a little bit since I could never imagine the feeling Kenny was going through, specifically with his best friend. But everyone is still a team, and as you fight through the bosses and all of the G3 cartel, you make it through to the final boss of the game, Garmantuous. A weird Jabba the Hutt like leader, rich and greedy and ugly and goopy. You fight him back on your home planet Earth a little bit after you unlock Let's Do It. He's no Elden Ring boss, but it was a decently challenging boss. Nothing wild moveset wise unfortunately, but after defeating this supposed invincible Garmantuous, you have to make a decision. And he, he can't be killed easily mind you, so you have to sacrifice one of your guns to go inside the boss's ass and set off a bomb to kill him from the inside out. Plot wise, Kenny steps up and asks to sacrifice himself, saying he knows what he's done and he will pay the price. It is funny because you don't have to set Kenny in. You could choose someone else if you really wanted to, but I knew that Kenny wanted to, so I stuffed Kenny in that ass and I watched as he blew up to goopy pieces. Until something insanely lucky happens as you turn around to hear a thud and from the sky, Kenny falls down, burned up, but still alive, you and your team of Galleons defeated the G3 and saved Earth. So overall, a good story with plenty of fun moments. It doesn't try to be too bold, but for a comedy game, the story caught me by surprise and added a good mix to the comedy. I really messed with the story. I thought the guns and gameplay itself were adequate, and the world designs are just great. Visually, it is a pretty beautiful game when you check your environments. I really love what I see so far. Except for these parts. As good as this game is, High on Life also sucks. There were some performance issues on launch, and although more things can be patched in the future of course, that doesn't make up for the people that played it early in its life. Glitchy moments sprinkled throughout my entire playthrough, and some entire segments were messed up due to unlawful performance issues. I did blame some of the things on the slightly older Xbox I was playing on, but not for the dozens or so screw ups. While randomly fighting in the slums, my gun Kenny just completely disappeared on me for 3 minutes and was frozen essentially. I had to reset twice since I was stuck in two different locations forcing me to reset the checkpoint. And then some of the area loading times were actually horrible, but I blame that portion mainly on the Xbox. These glitches and mess ups didn't control my game though, it never strayed my experience or my enjoyment. But it was noticeable enough to mention it and remember that it even happened in the first place. Other than performance, High on Life has two major issues that can leave a distaste in the player's mouths. The fighting sequences are pretty repetitive. I mentioned earlier there were ways around this, not only gun variety wise, but movement wise around the landscape. But the movement really comes down to avoiding enemies with a jetpack and positioning yourself far away to shoot headshots with Kenny. 
That's what most of my fights boiled down to, and I can probably suspect many other players did that as well. I tried to spice it up by using my entire arsenal, since I really did enjoy the differences in guns, but that just isn't efficient in comparison to just using Kenny. Pair that up with repeating enemies, it just made each new world feel a tiny bit lackluster since you're fighting the same three or four enemy types over and over again. I mean, that's natural in a lot of games, of course. Borderlands does this, but Borderlands increases both their intensity and their design, which High in Life never really did. Yeah, the core gameplay is fun, and it's okay enough to get you through the game, but the lack of new enemy introduction is always a negative. High in Life focused on its dialogue, its character interactions, and its comedy which is somehow the best and worst attribute about the entire game. It has some solid punchlines, and the fourth wall breaks can be pretty funny, but a lot of the jokes really just feel like a spin-off episode of Rick and Morty, which is fun for the fans, I guess, but not always a home run. A lot of the jokes are missable, and every character has that self-aware, stuttering tone in their voice, which gets a little oversaturated. I get that that's the point, but when everyone has a similar way of speech, even if the speech is funny, then it becomes nothing. Like, if everyone is special and unique, then doesn't that make everyone normal? It really is debatable to what kind of comedy suits you, though. Personally, I liked it, but truthfully, a lot of it didn't quite make the mark. One thing that actually had me upset was the main character, or you, the human you play as. Kenny and some of the characters feed off of what you do in the game with your actions. I think that's where the funniest voice lines come from, in my opinion. It makes it feel like the AI is talking or reacting based off of what you do. But other than that, sometimes to progress through the story, Kenny and some of the other characters will say these personal things to you, which just doesn't make sense to me. Kenny becomes my friend and says he trusts me, which is great, but my character itself just feels like a nobody. It's a weird complaint, not even much of a complaint exactly at all really, but I just personally feel like the character I was using was this lifeless body. Not enough personality to make it its own entity, but not enough customization to make them feel like me. So I found myself in this weird purgatory of mixed feelings, confused as to how I should feel about who I'm playing as. I might have just made those issues bigger than they are, but these problems really made the game go from like an 8 or 9 to a 7 or 8. So not horrible issues, just some unlikable qualities. Like the comedy is sometimes bad, but it's not that bad, I, th I think. What if I told you High on Life is a comedy game? Oh, the humor in High on Life is the main separation between critics and user score. While critics make it their job to critique every aspect of the game and compare it to the grand landscape that is gaming, the actual gamers sitting down to relax and play don't have to view it as such. These two massive differences in playstyles make High on Life two separate experiences. The reviewers are right. The humor can feel corny, lots of jokes don't often land, the self-aware dialogue can be way oversaturated, and the amount of talking can be super annoying. The critics are right about a lot of these things, but the user score, the people buying the game are also correct. The jokes are stupid and funny, the gags are consistent all the way through, and the self-aware dialogue is something not done before in any game. So both parties are right in this case, and I think that's amazing. If you don't vibe with the comedy, you can still enjoy the gameplay, but if the Rick and Morty style makes you laugh and is up your alley, then you're gonna love this game. So naturally, of course, the user score will be better than what the media says, and for those reasons, I can recommend the game. It's funny. Enough. It knows what it is, at least. It's not trying to be anything else. You see, in conclusion, High in Life has some strange flaws, but its positives are also strange balancing the negatives out. Its heavy inspiration to modern FPS with the addition of this Rick and Morty flair makes this a super laid back gaming experience. It's not better or even close to what it's inspired from, but the comedy does set it apart from that stigma. High on Life isn't trying to be these AAA games. No, it knows what it came to do and what it wants to be, which is why I actually adore the game. I loved the world and the differences in themes, and the story was great since it was so compact and well executed. I, I think it made a great foundation for the future if this development team wants to proceed. It's an amazing start to something, and even with the flaws, if they can do this again in a better way, they might have hooked me as a fan. I think it goes to show you can have some meaningful journeys even if you don't take yourself seriously, and an alien even sells his own shit. 
And I think that's the most hilarious part. So peace and love. My name is Rox. I'll see you.